Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Todd and Taylor Show. I'm Todd A. Taylor and we, Trask. And that is Taylor Trask. And we're back. We're back together again. We're back, yeah. Um, it, it feels like it's been a long time. It really hasn't been that long. <laughs> no, I know. That was just thinking the same thing. I'm like, it's it's a different month since we last spoke, but it's it hasn't been, I mean, it hasn't been like four weeks. It just by so much has happened since the last time on my side of things that it just feels so much longer. And I'm sure on your side too, it's probably similar. Yeah, it definitely, it definitely feels longer. So, um, we're, uh, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll set this up. We had a short conversation before, um, we hit record and, um, we, so when we, and this is the intro I've been doing all season. This is season one. We did a little, uh, preliminary season zero, um, where we tested the waters. We came up with this new format. Uh, for season one, and we have consistently broken one of our rules, which is we continue <laughs> to talk for like an hour and a half or more about yeah. something. And yeah. the, I, which is, you know, on one hand, it's cool because uh, our those that season zero episode, we were sort of cramming them full of all different topics. Yeah, we thought every yeah. week we talk about, and then we decided no for season one, we're just going to pick one topic, and it turns out we can still ramble for <laughs> a great deal of time on one topic. So. Um, with that said, our goal to, in this podcast right here is one hour. That's so. If you're I'm playing just, at home, we'll tell right. you start your timers now, and then we'll see how we did at the end of it all. Right. I'm just. I've got a big buzzer and <laughs> 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 the sad trombone or something that I will play when we hit that. So uh, that's our quick hello. We are going to do a, a roundup of some stuff that we've seen. And the first thing you put on that is The Martian. Have you seen yeah, it? Yeah, I have not. Oh. Uh, I was going to see it over the weekend. My, I was going to ask you if you've seen it. I have not. Um, ah, okay. So there's... <laughs> We've got are, you, are you excited to see it? Especially given uh, all the reviews and buzz of early audiences. Uh, I don't really care. I, it's, oh. Yeah, I don't, I'm not feeling any any way, any one... Yeah, I'm just not... I'm ambivalent in a, to a serious degree. Are you going to see it? Uh, I, I, I really can't even tell you at this point. <laughs> oh, wow. I mean, I could probably force myself out to see it this weekend. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, there's no motivation to see it or not to see it. And part of that reason for that is that I remember these two awful movies about Mars. Um, one of them I know starred Val Kilmer, I'm pretty oh, sure. Yes. I think they were yes. Mission to Mars and Red Planet. And, yeah, um, Red Planet, I remember for sure. And Mission one to Mars, I know, was the one that I saw. Didn't? Yeah, and I think that was Mission to Mars. And, um, I, I, you know, it's just weird. I'm, I'm just kind of like, I think I saw this movie. <laughs> well, Red Planet, so yeah, you're right. Red Planet was Val Kilmer, Carrie Ann Moss, Tom Sizemore. Mission to Mars was Gary Sinise, Tim Robbins, Don Cheadle. Yep. Wow. Yep. Cheadle. Both of them came out in the year 2000, so that's not confusing at all. Yeah. That's kind of like that year that those two, like, like the asteroid attacking the Earth movie with Morgan Freeman, and there's another one. Yeah, when there was Armageddon and um, I don't know what the other one was called, Big Asteroid. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's just wow. Well, this I, I think I can preliminarily those two movies, while I'm sure at the time seemed like great ideas and had their merits, I don't think hold a candle to this. From every everyone who has read the book yeah. is like, oh God, you've got to read the book. But now I'm like, and I'm always one of those guys who like. If, if the window has shut and there's either a TV show that looks really well done or a movie looks really well done, I will consume those before I consume the book. Um, if, if those are lackluster, then I'll go back and then read the book, see if it's any better. But a lot of times, I would rather just see it visually in its full form anyway because I'm more interested in that Which, um, yeah, usually. I believe we talked about that vis-a-vis uh, -vis Game of Thrones yes. um, probably back in the day um, because I'm kind of the opposite. Like If I hear that there's been a lot of buzz about the book – I, I, I sort of want to fake that <laughs> experience of like being in on it before anybody else. Yeah, so I'll go back and yeah. read it. But this one, I, it's, I feel the same way about the book. I don't really care about reading it. I, I you know, I would see, I would see the movie without reading the book and, and be fine. Yeah. Well, and I've heard people who've seen the movie and have read the book go, Ooh, the book, the movie's almost better. I'm like, really? Interesting. Yeah. Okay. And I, and, you know, it's, and it's one of those things too. The trailers have sort of sold me, you know, I really liked the movie moon. Um, directed by David Bowie's oh, yeah. son, I forget his name. Duncan Jones. Duncan Jones, thank you. And um, not that it's exactly the same thing, but it's still basically driven largely by one guy 
um, one guy's performance. And I'm kind of in, you know, is and Castaway. You know, we've seen this before, but we'll see. I don't know. It seems like Castaway, MacGyver, and Moon all rolled into one thing. Yeah. I'm curious how that comes off. To be honest, though, I'm almost more excited for the Steve Jobs movie. So I'm going to have to cram in two in the next two weeks uh, yeah. and just get them, get them all in. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, I will go see the Martian and I'll report back to you on what I find. Cool. I, I'll, I'll, I'll make an effort. I might, I might go see that. There's no other, there's no other movie right now. We're sort of in that weird, um, uh, you know, uh, dead zone of movies right yeah. now. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, um, we've got Steve Jobs coming up. We've got the uh, Hunger Games movie coming up. We've got we're we're inching ever closer to the. We got Spectre coming up. You yeah, know, all exactly. of that's just around the horizon. And it's interesting you mentioned the Steve Jobs movie because I am super excited about. Um, I believe it's called Man in the Machine, which is the Alex Gibney documentary about Steve Jobs. Ooh, I've um, heard of that. Which was uh, uh, he's a, a filmmaker I really like. He did the. Um, <laughs> smartest guys in the room which is about enron and he did mm. client eight or whatever is about um uh oh elliot spitzer and mm-hmm. he did going clear the scientology oh movie. that's all that same dude and he also did we steal secrets about WikiLeaks. Oh, um, i love all those yeah i think i just think he's um you know a, a, a really interesting filmmaker um he released man in the machine um simultaneously like theaters and and uh on like Beauty. Google Google Play and yeah. Oh sure. Stuff. Okay. So um so yeah, you can watch Steve Jobs, the Man in the Machine, right now. Dang, I'm um, my dude. That we're done. So. Uh, but apparently, it's kind of a negative portrait of him. Okay. So, well, and that you know what the Walter Isaacs, I think the Walter Isaacson book is sort of negative too. You know, I feel it's 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 accurate, but it it paints him. There's I the drinking game I play with the Walter Isaacson Steve Jobs book. That's the one that's got the picture of him sort of like, you know, with the fingers by the, by the mouth. Yeah. I kind of, that book, there's a drinking game you play every time it says Steve was furious, take a shot. And it seems to happen quite a bit. And I feel like that's the book that Aaron Sorkin channeled into this movie. Um, So it'll be curious to see how that comes off too. So I'm, I don't know. At the end of the day, you know, love him, love him or hate him. Like I'm just, I think it's, it's a fascinating time to, to learn more about, different sides of the character or different sides of the guy you know ash and kutcher yeah. provided one side that no one's re- no one was really interested in and i you know i even go back to noah wiley in pirates of silicon valley from like 1998 1999 um that tnt mo- tv movie which is still you know it definitely it's it's got 90s all over but noah wiley was pretty good as steve jobs in that man so that I'd was forgotten all about that yeah and do and and t- remember who was uh bill gates remember who played him don't, don't cheat. Anthony Michael Hall was Bill Gates. Oh my God, you're right. And he was amazing. This. He was fantastic. Really? Yes, he was perfect, Bill Gates. So the whole thing was, I don't know. And they did, they did what they could with the resources of the time. But I think you know, even today, it still has yeah. a lot, has a lot of merit. So check the, that out. The Pirates of Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> In fact, the only weak link is the guy who plays Steve Ballmer. He's way too theatery and just he's like, I'm Steve Ballmer. I mean, it's ba- they could have just gotten Chris Farley to play Steve Ballmer. Wow. It was, it's that right. sort of over the top performance. But other than that, it's, you know, it's, it's, I think it's great. Huh. Um, the other thing I was going to ask you is um, have you had a chance since we did the Doctor Who episode to watch any of the new episodes or are you still sort of holding off for the time being? I have not watched any of the new episodes. Let me give you a recommendation. Okay. They're they're doing the theme of this season seems to be two parters. They haven't done two parters for a while, and now it seems like every episode is going to be a two parter. Um, they start aired uh, one last weekend, last Saturday, called Under the Lake. It's part one of two. Two comes out this next weekend. Watch that. If that doesn't compel you or interest you in any way, you're probably not going to get into the show. If if there's an inkling of interest there, I that that's the first episode in a while where I was like, ooh, wow. This huh, is, okay. they're really, they're, it, it, it's quickly becoming one of my top 10 just because, and we'll see how it ends. We'll see where they take it, but they left this mystery build and they, 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 they took their time with it. And there's just, it's, it's getting really juicy. Um, okay. so definitely if you are at home or are you Todd, Todd, Hey, listening, like if you want to check out the season or check out the show and you haven't yet start there and see what happens. All right. Okay. Good recommendation. I did watch blink. <laughs> what did you think of Blink? Uh, I mean, I was sort of interested, but it didn't. It did not overcome my uh, 
bias biases against it i guess mm, is the way okay I say it. okay um no i don't i don't think i like filter it through that through a bias it's just that um uh it it you know i i knowing that like well this you know carrie mulligan's not gonna be in the next episode i was sort of like i'm not really uh, interested. you know sure, it was like sure. i'm interested in it for this this story but um which is you know i mean that's kind of what we brought up during that episode is i that's a problem with that sort of anthology uh you know telling of it like it's mm -hmm. you know one at one episode you're maybe you're really into and the next one maybe you're not and maybe they're rectifying that with these two parters and peter capaldi's you know different portrayal of of the doctor oh dude he's been bringing it to acting wise like oh i mean he was great last season but he just keeps elevating that show acting across the board like he's got he he really plays different sides of that character that we have not seen in the modern series that i'm just i oh i keep i keep just falling in love with that character more and more <laughs> um i don't want to get off on a tangent there the other couple of things two more things two more things for our yeah. sort of our grab bag um new york comic-con is is here almost here basically and if you're listening to this still around that time image comics is running a massive sale on all their digital stuff oh yeah so if, Go to Image Comics right now. You don't have to even go to the NYCC. You can just go to imagecomics.com, and they've got 99-cent digital issues and 50% off um, digital trade paperbacks on pretty much everything. I mean, there's some stuff. New stuff isn't, but a lot of great series that we've talked about, that we've reviewed. Um, if you want to you know, put your toe in the water with a single issue, it's a buck. You want to put your toe in the water with a series, you know, like Wicked and Divine, or any of those at East of West, five bucks for the you know trade, uh, you know, volume one trade paperback. So, really good deal going on right now. Yeah, that is an awesome deal. And then the other thing I noticed, and this is this is literally 15 minutes before we started recording, I was just perusing news, and I bring this up only because it's a question in nerd geek circles that keeps coming back again and again and again, and that is, what ever happened to Rick Moranis? <laughs> And you know, Rick Moranis, who was, you know, who ruled the 80s, he was that, he was like everything that Fred Armisen is in now, Rick Moranis would have been in the set, you know, in the 80s, basically all yeah. the way through. Like, he's that guy. And then he just disappeared one day. Like, he was in Honey, I, Sh you know, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, was kind of like his, his big franchise. And then he slowly started to disappear. Well, Hollywood Reporter has a rare, you know, interview with him where they kind of delve into everything where he's been what he's been up to and he actually did it because so many people have been coming out of the woodwork hunting him down going why aren't you in the new he turned down a cameo in the new ghostbusters movie yeah i'd heard that that was the headline i'd seen um, yeah and everybody's like why what's wrong and that that took him so by surprise and i think a lot of people when they were, they were coming at him with that question they were like you haven't you've been retired or you've been i think people feel bad that like he hasn't been and stuff and he's like no no i'm i'm fine i'm i'm okay right. I, I haven't been retired at all i've actually been doing stuff just you know more under the radar and and i turned it down because i just don't see why being in a, a cameo role for something i did 30 years ago is makes sense to me so he's very candid but he's all it's really refreshing to kind of hear his point of view on things so um check out the hollywood reporter we'll i guess probably put this on the website or on, on you know somehow attach this to the sure. episodes you can check out the link too but if you ever wondered what happened to rick moranis he's he's still out there yeah i Looks read great a too. little bit of it before we started and it yeah it's a it's a pretty interesting story you know i like that idea that he's like no i, I just moved <laughs> yeah yeah i just moved and his i mean to be fair his wife passed away you know several years ago and he had his his kids were very young so he spent a lot of time raising them and mm -hmm. um but he's still been very involved in entertainment he's just and he'll say a couple times in the article, he's like, I'm just very picky and I'm probably increasingly so. Yeah. So it's, you know, um, which is good for him. You know, it's great that he has, he can, he has made enough money or he's doing well enough where he can feel like he can have, you know, make, have discernible taste and not just jump at anything and everything. And people still love him. So it's not like he's, you know, not, it's not like he burned his career out and he doesn't know what to do. Yeah. I mean, we haven't seen Dave Thomas in a while either, have we? No, God, <laughs> not since the Wendy's commercials. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I didn't mean that guy. I meant I mean Rick Moranis' partner from <laughs> from Strange Brew. I know, no, I know, but you know, I, I've always thought whenever the <laughs> those Wendy's commercials aired, I always, as a kid, I was always like, "Is that the same Dave Thomas?" Because they're oh, they're funny. heftier gentlemen. They sort of have sort of a similar kind of look and feel. And I was always confused until IMDb came around. I was always confused that that was the same dude. I thought it was just oh, they hired that guy to be the spokesman, quote unquote, of Wendy's. Right. So, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> sort of like the Norm McDonald as Colonel Sanders. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Which that still blows my mind. <laughs> that fact that you just said that out loud, I'm like, what, huh? I do not even – have you seen these commercials? I do not even get this joke. The joke is that, like, he's not the real Colonel Sanders. And so he keeps – there's some – thing in every commercial of he's taking a lie detector test and you know is this chicken extra crispy yes are you the real colonel sanders yes and then it buzzes i don't get it what's the joke uh i think it's i think i think the ad agency is peopled by a bunch of folks who loved snl in the 90s and were like we need to find a way to get him back in in the swing of things yeah because daryl hammond was the last one oh really i didn't know yeah. that oh yeah. maybe just it's like two of, months ago maybe sherry o'terry will pop up at some point then too oh that would be great well, what <laughs> what else have we been up to since we've been away from this? I, well, I went on a trip to Minnesota over the weekend, and I had a couple of days off, and I, I deliberately spent the afternoon of one of those at a really great comic store in Minneapolis, very close to where my uh, friends who I was staying with live up in Golden Valley. Um, fantastic store. Huge, huge, massive selection. I had a huge hit list of stuff I wanted to at least peruse and check out, so I made a huge stack, took you know, walked over to one of their comfy couches and just sat there perusing top of that list was black science which you recommended in our last comic roundup yes um image release of course you know at, at, from this point on unless we say otherwise just assume everything we recommend is an image <laughs> release because I, unless it's like deliberately marvel or, or dc like everything we talk about everything i love is is pretty much image at this point but uh picked up black science and, and really gave it a, a good on and i picked up two or three volumes because i'm like well maybe if i can't get into one or if i love them all i just want to get them all um, I, 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 I perused them. I didn't deep dive, read every single page, but I just couldn't wrap my head around. I, I get why you like it. And it, I, I see there's, there, it's, it looks great. There's quality in it. I just can't wrap my head around the artwork. And it just, it seemed too pulp sci-fi for my taste. Well, that's such, I mean, you know, cause we talk a lot about how art gets us into the book. So I think that's mm -hmm. a, that's a really cool, uh, reaction to bring up. Because, you know, because like Wicked and Divine, when our, you know, previous um, comic book roundup, um, you, you would really, you know, pitch that one and I had read it too. And and my comment in our last podcast um, was, you know, I like the art, but it's a little too clean for me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then you exactly. can see, obviously, from from flipping through black science, you know, the kind of stuff I like, you know, that real yeah. rough, rough pencil work. And But it's still very, it's very good art. You know, it's very... Yeah. Um, I mean, it looks great. It just wasn't, you know, and it's very much of the era, you know, of the, of the 1950s pulp sci-fi. Yeah. You know, and that's, and that's, and they seem like they're nailing it. I just, when I heard different dimensions and, you know, you know sort of a quantum leap like aspect yeah. to this or a sliders aspect, I kind of expected at least a little bit more normal sort of kind of stuff injected into it and it just seemed to be every it's every bonkers. chance they got they're like here's another crazy like weird alien and bizarre yeah. sort of lovecraftian kind of thing and I'm like and that's cool it's just not my particular cup of tea you know yeah and and i i love that you said uh like the pulp sci-fi because that i hadn't really thought of that or, or translated it into that but you're exactly right and that's definitely the feel of that comic and i i think the thing about that um I'm not definitely not trying to like resell you on it. I think your points are oh, go absolutely ahead. valid, but that that first I trade, didn't, I didn't, you know, was so it was so breathlessly written to, mm -hmm. in, in my mind that it's sort of like it's sort of hard to to you know pick and choose what you like about it. And I really, mm -hmm. you know, I I did the same thing. Like I kind of flipped through it when I was it was picking it up, and I just closed it and went, no way, I'm I'm going on the recommendation of my friend Jeremy, and mm -hmm. I just bought it, you know, wow, and. So had had I kind of you know been a little pickier and flipping through it, I might have thought, oh man, I'll never get into the story. But then it just turns out that that story is so fast paced that you know I just tore through it in one Maybe sitting. Maybe I should be more. So, I mean, when you say that though, like that's exactly what I did to <clears throat> Wicked End of Mine and yeah. Manifest Destiny, which um, were recommended to me by one of my three comic shops in Portland I went to, like the one that was like you know the basically the bookseller in Never Ending Story as yeah. a comic shop like that dude was like you'll want to read these and i kind of just i was so captivating he seems so so on the ball in terms of his recommendations i'm like okay and i flipped through him just to make sure the art was my cup of tea and i took him home and i was like holy crap so maybe i should just maybe i should maybe i should do well, that with black science because it's five bucks on 
image. Well, that, I that is a in. good argument for it. But, but I'm a, I'm a complete supporter of, you know, if you didn't, if you didn't get that, that feeling right off the bat, then, you know, let it alone. Mm. Like, cause that, that synthesis of the art and the story is so mm. important to comics. And again, like there's another item we need to, we need to bullet point and put in that future episode about like how to get back into comics if you're, you know, yes. out of the loop. But that's, but I'm, I'm a huge supporter of that. Like if you, if you're, if you're just not feeling it, like that's cool. There's something else out there, you know, I'd hate for you to read a book and be turned off by it. And, you know, well, let, me you, throw you one other, been... let me throw one other sort of kink in that though. If you, if you're not feeling it and you're turned off by it, don't necessarily just dismiss it out of hand. And I say this because one of the other things I did buy at this comic shop over the weekend was the trade paperback volume one of they're not like us. Mm -hmm. And this is, I have been fascinated by the, it, the, one of the things I love about image is that they're really, they really think a lot about packaging and the covers and there's a heavy graphic design element to everything they do. Most of you know, most of the series and they've always had interesting covers. The art has always turned me off. I always look at the art going, it's, it's not, it's kind of that weird sort of, just not not my cup of tea. And then I, I you know I perused one of the issues. I'm just like, mm. so I've kept an eye on it, and it's always kind of been one of those things that keeps coming back, keeps coming back. So I sat down with the trade paperback, and it's one of those stories where when you see all six issues back to back, it's it's the best way to describe it is. Whereas East of West, Wicked of Divine are great TV seasons, so each episode can stand on its own and then you take them in totality in the trade paperbacks, but you can still enjoy each individual episode as it is. Right. Um, they're not like us is like a Sherlock, you know, like the, the modern day BBC Sherlock show. Uh, you have to watch it all at once or it's not going to make any sense. It would be like <laughs> taking an episode of Sherlock and watching 15 minutes at a time. You're like, this is not fulfilling at all. And I'm not getting the full picture. You've got to read it start to finish and doing so, I have a new appreciation for the art, actually, that I never thought I would. It works completely well for that story. I don't think I would like it as much if it had Wicked and Divine art, which I love, too. I mean, I'm a huge fan of the Wicked and Divine art, uh, of the first two volumes, or even East to West. I don't think I would like it as much if it was that. I would right. still like it, but I think there's something that this art does with this story that never had I and I never had anticipated. And I got done. I was just like, holy crap. What a, I mean, I, I got sucked into that thing faster than I even thought it's probably of all the stuff I've acquired this year. It's in my top five this year for sure. Wow. Well, that's, that's such an awesome endorsement. I've been completely lazy on the comic book front um, and have <clears throat> only purchased black science trade paperback volume two um, tore through that one in one sitting as well. Um, if the myriad monsters and dimensions and stuff turned you off of the first one like the second one isn't going to invite you in <laughs> because it is like it starts you know sort of like in the middle of something that that was you know I, you you end up piecing it together but it you know at the beginning you're like what in the shit is going on here and it mm -hmm. you know it just gets more bonkers from there so it definitely uh you know fed the <laughs> the need that i had to see more of that crazy uh, dimension jumping and more of the twists and turns. Nice. Um, it's definitely, you know, I mean, uh, it, that, that trick is only going to go so far. So I'm interested in where they, where they turn the corner and, and start fixing the problems instead of adding, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. piling the, the problems back on. But, sure, um, sure. you know, well, for I mean, right, for right now, I'm like, you know, in for the ride. So, well, let's take that as a good segue into kind of our topic, Yes. So we wanted to we wanted to sort of spend more time on. Yes, this is a topic you suggested. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's one that's kind of been banging around my my the circles I travel in for a while. Um, discussions I have on IO9 or with other you know other fans of this kind of stuff or other fans of genre. Um, but using black science kind of as as sort of our intro into it is what constitutes sci-fi? How does sci-fi get defined? for these kinds of things. And what is, is there a clear line between science fiction and science fantasy or hard sci-fi? I keep, one of the big things I keep hearing on io9 is, well, that's hard sci-fi. And I'm always like, what is, what is that? What does that even mean? Like, how does that, and I, and, and nobody, there's no sort of, you know, like, like massive group agreements on, on these terms. It is kind of like whatever your flavor is and how you define it. I mean, there's some commonality, but I really, for you too, because we've been we've been talking about this stuff for forever, and I, I'm I'm really curious how you perceive it. 
And then just if, if there's, if I am coming in at the wrong way, cause I keep getting called on this quite a bit in different, in different discussions. Like, well, that's not really science. That's not really sci-fi. You know, again, going back to Dr. Who, like they, a lot of people right. look at the current season of Dr. Who is, well, that's not really sci-fi. I'm like, well, it was it ever like, Oh yes. Yes. So the old series used to be for very hard sci-fi and it's not really that anymore. I'm like, okay, I guess. Well, I'm interested as, as someone who's not participated in those discussions, what, what those definitions actually are, or at least as, as far as you understand them. Um, yeah. What is so, hard, hard sci-fi? The way, the way it's presented to me kind of, if, if, if there is a common sort of thread, it's that these are stories that, definitely have to do with, with space space is involved in some way hmm. whether an alien planet an alien life form an alien civilization our civilization in the future living in space something involving space itself i feel like i don't think i've ever seen a sci-fi you know genre or, or or property that didn't have space in some way shape or form um pardon me i think there has to be I think a lot of the the drama and the story has to arrive out of even if it's made up logic it has to have a logical base like this you know this science or you know like like you know even if it's like a science we haven't discovered yet like time travel or something like that like but that science begat these circumstances and this story will stick very, very, you know, very solidly in the in the reality of those circumstances. We're not going to get, right, right. you know, we're not going to inject magical thinking or anything like that. Um, other that's, things that's that the I, hard part of it. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it's, and that's where I have trouble drawing the line. A couple other things, is, you know, let's let's use Doctor Who as a, as an example. Like, um, you know, the fact that he travels through time is fine, but the fact that his time machine is bigger on the inside is not necessarily fine hmm. you know it's like that almost that strains too much credulity you know even though if they say well his race mastered dimensional physics well yes but it seems to be i think when those things are too casual then it becomes well it's science fantasy i think the sonic screwdriver definitely science fantasy they're like well that doesn't have any there's no rules imposed upon it it's just sort of a macguffin that does whatever the show needs it to do so that's science that's sci fantasy it's not right you know he he didn't use the sonic screwdriver that much. It was a tool back in the old series. Now it's like a magic wand. So I guess you know there's that there's that sort of element to it. I know this that when you know when we talk about like Star Trek, like Star Trek is always considered what's well, that's, that's sci-fi. Star Wars is what's well, sci that's science fantasy or just pure fantasy. Like it's I don't I don't think I've ever talked to anybody who's been you know uh, adamant that Star Wars is sci-fi. Well, um, I, there's a really interesting thing there too because um I, you know, I, I, I probably would have just called it sci-fi if we weren't having this discussion, you know? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, you, you brought up, um, an, an element that's, that's, uh, you know, common, if not uh, like, you know, completely ubiquitous, which is the, the futuristic element. Mm -hmm. And so Star Wars instantly disqualifies itself. Um, oh wait, you didn't bring up futurism. You brought up space. So I was yeah, going to say yeah. Star Wars goes into that space, you know, yeah, it's in space. So you're, you're likely to say it's sci-fi, but, um, I think one of the other qualifications is often when it's in the future. Um, mm -hmm. and S Star Wars is, you know, absolutely said in the past, um, mm -hmm. you know, a long time ago or whatever it is, the <laughs> far, far away. Like it's, um, so it's just funny that it, it kind of pulls itself out of that um, intentionally, you know, mm -hmm. whereas Star Trek is obviously like, you know, dated into the future. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and keep in mind too, Star Trek, again, a lot of that stuff, you know, when you introduce on, you know, in Star Wars, you introduce the force. Right. That's, you know, I think as soon as you do that, it, this inexplicable, you know, sort of re, you know, quasi religious thing, then it's right. like, well, it's not sci fi anymore. It's, there's not, it's, that's not tied to anything logical anymore. Well, but then um, it kind of got retconned into sci fi, you know, like, oh, no, yeah. it's these little tiny atoms in your being that you control or whatever. So I would be really curious to know from a, from a hardcore Star Wars fan or a hardcore, you know, like sci fi, like, I know what sci fi is. Would they would they allow that to pass? Would they go? Well, that is. I mean, that is based on, a, or, or by that point, is it is the retcon too? Is it too big of a of a jump, right? To even be considered, you know. And it's like, and I think too, with Star Trek, like there is, you know, 
I, I honestly think what it comes down to is the science part of science fiction. Right, right. That seems strong and, and, and intentional. Then people are a lot more likely to go, well, that's sci-fi. I don't know what constitutes hard sci-fi, quote unquote, because I've heard that used a few times too. And I'm always just like, especially when I, I bring up certain comic series or I'm like, you know, well, this is sci-fi. I'm like, well, no, but th this is hard sci-fi. I'm just like, what, how does, how do you quantify that? Like, how does that even like is, is, um, I'm trying to think of an example is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh goodness gracious. Not, what, um, what would leap to my mind are it's, it's funny because, you know, one of the things I went to is like a, a list of subgenres of sci-fi to see these things, and what oh, sure. in my mind is stuff like, like is Blade Runner hard sci-fi? There know? we go. Yeah. Or is um, uh, uh, Minority Report? And both of those are William Gibson stories, I believe, and mm -hmm. he's more of the you know cyberpunk guy. Um, yeah, yeah. So, well, you know, <laughs> where are we are crossing the genres too much? Like that's that's sort of I would think those are foreseeable futures of mankind, mm -hmm. uh, humankind. So is that, you know, does that constitute hard sci-fi? Is that what that is? Like, is it, you mm -hmm. know, technically possible or something? Um, yeah. Well, like the time machine, like HG Wells, the time machine, right. What would you, how would you quantify, like, what would you, how would you categorize that? I see. I would think that that's like science fantasy. Why do you say that? Um, I, <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah, but I it's mean, a gut reaction that you right, have, and that's right, an important right. part of this because I think a lot of people fall, you know, on those on those sort of initial reactions. I, I guess it's because I the, the the general representations of time travel to me are are very fantastic. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so and and honestly, like once once I say that, I think yeah, okay, so Doctor Who is science fantasy. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas previously I would have said sci-fi yeah um, yeah huh is that just because well and, and you know i look at you know so there's there's only a handful of those classic doctor who episodes that i actually can enjoy and look past the production values and right slow pacing on stuff and it, i wonder the ones i do like so here's a great example there's when patrick troughton took over um you know in the in the 60s there was and it was still black and white mind you there was this episode run called Enemy of the World, and they recently unearthed it and put it out on iTunes, and, and I found it a couple years ago. And in Enemy of the World, the doctor goes to a, a you know, uh, I think it would even be now, you know, in the 60s, I think they were saying like in the year 2020, 25, something like that. Um, the world is, is slightly different, but still sort of similar, but Mexico has, ri you know, has, has risen in power and influence. And there's a Mexican dictator named like Eduardo Salamander, but they just keep calling him Salamander after that. And uh, he has he you know he's kind of coined the world's energy and um, you know he can uh, he's he's kind of built his empire out of his business dealings and he looks exactly like the doctor he's played by the same actor so it's kind of cool to see that sort of duality in just the acting but um, they have to solve you know they they have to figure out who the, they think the doctor is Salamander at first and they realize he's not and they they, they want to kind of basically plan a coup and use him as sort of their plan for that and he really can't he can't get out of it. So they, he sort of goes along with it. But while they're going along with it, they find out that Salamander is doing all these other, he's actually spoilers. He's actually keeping a group of people hidden under the earth in this sort of special, <laughs> in this special sort of uh, testing chamber. And they actually can influence, you know, like uh, global weather and, and, and energy and all these kinds of things. And it was supposed to be just be like a, a, a laboratory thing, but he's convinced them that the earth has, it has gone through an apocalypse and they're the last surviving human so that they stay down there. So he relies on them to kind of manipulate stuff for him. And I'm watching this going, you know, this is all basically like futuristic geopolitics kind of dystopian stuff. Right. I don't think that's, that would fall in the realm of sci-fi as a lot of those people. I mean, I, I don't even know what you call that. Like, you know, fiction fantasy. You're just I mean, plain fi I mean, it's plain fiction either way. But – it's not really fantasy in, in that in that hardened sense, but it is kind of a fantasy in that what, what's you know what could be you know is this fan right. it's a fantastical sort of imagining of what the future could be without a lot of hard sort of science based kinds of stuff involved. See, that's that's where I get confused. I'm like, well, what would you guys call that? Well, and to me, so much of this is like, especially for you, you and I discussing it, is a real slippery slope because I I don't think either of us really cares what subgenre exactly. it falls into. 
exactly. That's, and so it's a, it's sort of like, um, you know, we don't want to turn too arg argumentative about it because we're not like trying to push one thing or another into science fiction or science fantasy. To me, I think that's, um, it, I, to me, it's just sort of like that, that all fits in sci-fi. I don't really need to argue about, yeah, yeah. The, you know, whether, well, it's, whether it's fantasy or hard sci-fi or, you know, cyberpunk or time travel or whatever, it's just, you know, it's all sci-fi. One of the big ones that keeps coming back around, though, and this is on io9 when I have these discussions, this is always the one that, you know, other than Doctor Who, this is the one that sets people off, not, not angrily, but just the sets off the opinions. And that's the, um, the Frank Herbert book, Dune. Right. Um, and, that's, and, and I have been ever increasingly interested in Dune having sort of first – I never read the book originally. I saw the, the sci-fi channels, um, original miniseries, and then they did a follow-up called Children of Dune where they merged a couple other books together. So I was really fascinated by that. Since have read the book, since have watched, you know, the Joe Dorosky documentary about what his version of Dune would have been. So I'm pretty versed in that world now. But I have always thought of it as science fantasy. Okay. Um, it, it, to me, it's almost the perfect representation of science fantasy in that it has some very grounded, realistic reasons for why the world and the universe that they're telling that story in is how it is. But there's so much religious symbolism and just sort of philosophical symbolism and kind of just it is what it is kinds of ways of telling the story and just you kind of have to suspend your disbelief a lot that it definitely more so than star wars even falls into that camp i've had people on io9 and other places tell me though oh no no that is that is sci-fi that is that is very much sci-fi so I'm like huh. how how would you guys even know and like the way i understand i mean let me are you familiar with dune have you read it no, lately at or all. or at all Never. It's, that should be something. Maybe we do a whole. Maybe we do a whole podcast about that sometime because that's. I think once you have familiarized yourself with it, and I would say for anybody at home listening, don't start with the 1985 David Lynch movie. That is not. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a lot of people's favorites, but it is not the story as it should be. It is. It takes a lot of liberties. It is almost to Dune as the um, 1970s shine to the book the shining there's elements of the story there but it is a different beast entirely okay um th yeah i would start and the sci-fi miniseries is not great in terms of production value but it definitely gets the story across in a in a pure better way um i like children of doing too because it has james mcavee that was like one of the first things he was ever in he's in it and just owns it and they, they raise the production values considerably so you can almost if you watch children of dune you can almost go back and sort of retroactively appreciate dune as the miniseries just knowing where it's going from there i, I bring all this up because like a spoiler free version of the story is in the future like far 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 future so in a, in a, you know as far back as star wars was this is so far in the future mankind goes awry and almost wipes us completely out. And there's this thing called the Boolean Jihad, where man fight, you know, faces off against AI, and we win, but just barely. And they say, from now on, the, the, the only commandment is man shall not make a computer in his own image. We're never going to do this again. This will never happen again. And we're done with that. So to, to fill in the gaps, um, because you know, AI and just computer in general, computers in general did so much for us, they start to breed and condition humans for various functions so they're you know and this happens over the course of hundreds of years so uh humanity becomes what's called uh the spacing guild and they uh, they become navigators for these starships so instead of having a computer navigate you know your starship a person expands their mind expands their mind and you know even changes their physical shape over you know over the years of evolution to basically run a starship and they do that by ingesting a large amount of spice, uh, which is only found on one planet in the entire universe, Arrakis. And that's actually the crux of the story is the, the universe kind of, at that point, um, humanity kind of falls into a feudal system. So there's, you know, there's like, you know, a 10, 10 to 20 ruling families and there's an emperor who oversees all of it. And the ruling families have, you know, they're jockeying for position and power. Well, the emperor kicks out the Harkonnens who are managing Arrakis and they were just, they were really being shitty to the people at Iraq because they kicked them out. And then Duke Leto of House Atreides gets brought in to manage it. And Paul Atreides, who's our main character, we meet him just as his family is going to Arrakis 
to set up shop to start managing the spice production there. It's the only place in the universe where it's so much like the, you know the Middle East is largely at least at the you know in days past was largely responsible for the oil. Um, this desert planet of Arrakis was responsible for all the spice. Other other versions of humanity morph into different ways. So um, you have the Spacing Guild, which I just described. You have also what's called a Mentat. So looks looks just like a person, but they have been conditioned from birth and through evolution to be basically human computers. So like walking Googles, essentially. You know, you can ask them whatever. They have vast amounts of knowledge stored in their heads. They can do you know all kinds of things. There's another group called the Bene Gesserit, which is this sort of um, you know priestesshood, and they. Um, you know, they have some clairvoyant abilities and they're always trying to find, uh, you know, th they're working on this breeding program because they have this whole prophecy about this, this, you know, sort of this uh, sort of messiah figure that's going to save everybody. And so they're, they're working on that. So it, humanity kind of splits itself up along these paths. And that's sort of where we find, you know, Paul at the beginning of the story. And then he has to navigate all this stuff. And then he had the book. You know, he has grown as a person considerably, but also the way humanity looks at itself is 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 altered based on his sort of what he does and the things he you know the things he not going on there. But there, it really delves into a lot of that fantasy element. There's grounded, realistic reason for why every group is the way it is, which is cool. You may not know it right away. They may get to it later on in the book or the delve into it in future books, but that universe is pretty well mapped out, you know, a book or two. So I don't know if you call that sci-fi or if you call that science fantasy. I mean, it doesn't, you're totally right. It doesn't matter. At the end of the day, like yeah. I'm becoming less and less a genre. I mean, I, I, I care less and less about genre. And I'm actually looking for people who can bend that on its head. But when you're communicating these stories or if you're if you're taking a book to market or you're making a short film like there are still a huge chunk of the market who needs to have a label put on it so right what, how do you navigate that like how do you where do you take a story like doing today is it i mean do you call it sci-fi you know uh are the people who really love sci-fi who are creating their own little tribe delving for, you know getting for, more and more firm about what that is are they gonna look at that the same way right it's um yeah, I mean that's I'm sitting here like racking my brain thinking about it, and and I hate that it's the go-to example, but um, but Game of Thrones, <laughs> for example, yeah. um, is, uh, you know, I I would say it sort of broadly falls into f fantasy, you know, mm -hmm. um, but what always shocks me is when they um, w when they do something, uh. It, disgusting or <laughs> personally <laughs> offensive to me or something in the show. And I complain about that to my friends. <clears throat> they go, well, I mean, this is sort of like it was in the middle ages. And I go, no, it's a fantasy. <laughs> they can write it however they want. There aren't any, mm -hmm. you know, this is not a history of the middle ages plus dragons. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. it's fantasy. So can't like, you know, I mean, I, like you know, I'll, I'll I'll bring up something like, why does Daenerys want to be the queen of you know Westeros so badly? I mean, why doesn't she just mm -hmm. start like a you know a, a, a democracy? And and my friends will retort like, well, it's like the Middle Ages, man. They didn't have democracy. No, they had dragons, mm -hmm. man. They can have whatever they want. <laughs> you know. So yeah, I, yeah. I I know that's just a that's an awkward and weird uh, transition, but. Um, well, let me. Well, you know, let's, at, let's, at some point, whatever you throw in there, like genre-wise, it's like, yeah, I mean, why, why isn't Star Wars and Star Trek? Aren't, why aren't they all fantasy or, yeah. or all sci-fi? Well, let me ask you something? this. I got, I got. So I'm glad you brought that up as an example because I've got two, two questions based off that. The first, what would it take to make to take Game of Thrones as it currently is? What would you have to add to it to make it a sci-fi show? Man, very, very little. They've already got, uh, you know, uh, two moons or two suns or something. I mean, it's already like uh, sci-fi in that in that aspect. You know, um, I don't know. If you found out, if you found out that like, um, then all of a sudden it just be, it was revealed that, and the, and the whole thing is basically like a West World where like everybody's right. this is just a giant. Like the camera pans out, and all of Westeros is just one giant theme park gone wrong. Right. You know, like, is that 
that, would that show suddenly be a sci-fi show and like fantasy would be like, well, it's not that actually it's sci-fi because look, it's all, you know, would that, or would it still be firmly fantasy to you? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I just, I'm kind of like you, like, I just sort of don't care. I like it twisting whatever it's doing. You know, I mean, I like when it twists it on its head and mm -hmm. I guess that's where I've had disappointments over the years. It's because um, it's not twisting it on its head. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, it's falling into that. Um, you know, if anything, it's like it, it, those, those things where it, when it doesn't twist genre or, or twist expectation, you know, like we've talked about how, defying expectations is sort of how they defy it. Like we expect the unexpected so much with game of Thrones that it's sort of, mm -hmm. you know, a, <laughs> a, an infinite loop or something like they're not actually like, they've got to sort of, you know, go along with normal storytelling in order to, you know, usurp mm -hmm. that once in a while. Um, uh, in, in, you... it's, it's almost become conventional compared to something like Lord of the Rings, which is mm. so freaking fantastical, you know, yeah. Um, whereas Game of Thrones is meh, basically like. Can you imagine that if that's how they actually started Westworld? Like, because HBO is doing Westworld too, still like yeah. a year away. Can you imagine that if all of a sudden, like the last, you know, it's it's next season? There's like this epic battle, and like the camera just sort of pans. Like something happens. Like Jon Snow, he you knows. Let's pretend he's not dead because he's not. And like uh, one of the White Walkers, like you know, just chops his head off, and like a robot head just rolls. Ah, that would be pans, so amazing. Pans, and the camera pans out, pans to that like that uh, cool whatever that that thing is in the intro credits that spins around and stuff. Pans out, and then all of a sudden it, it shifts around, and it's very much like the Truman Show. You're outside the world, and Anthony Hopkins is standing there. He he sighs, just like oh, not another one, and just walks off. And you see him like walk off to the, the West World side of the hallway, where like that shows, and it basically and it's like coming, you know, coming next week. West, and all of a sudden Game of Thrones is just over. It's like what the. How did, what? Like, wouldn't that just be the most, it'd be the most gutsy creative choice HBO has ever made. And that, and, I mean, yeah, it's just like, and I didn't <laughs> watch the show, but it's just like how, if I, you know, uh, <laughs> several, several many thousands of people probably suggested how great it would have been if Walter White just joined the <laughs> witness protection program and then Malcolm in the middle started. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> but, that, the, I, wow! The, that, you know, you ask a question about what does it take for Game of Thrones to become sci-fi or something, and I'll tell you one of those great crossovers is um, the uh, 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 Wildfire, where they like so the pyromancers who live in the you know um, in the Red Keep, I guess they make wildfire by mm -hmm. scientific means. But uh, you know, yeah. you sort of. But in that context of dragons and you know um, uh, men that can't be killed and stuff like that, it all of a sudden becomes kind of a fantasy thing. Like they're you know they're throwing this green goo that bursts into flames or whatever. But mm -hmm. you know, technically there was there was basically like a scientist working on that. You know, um, well, there's another great point though too. So like here's connect that to and you had it in your notes so I'll, I'll intentionally draw the comparison but it's a good one connect that to bruce banner working on you know the atom you know the the gamma bomb or like the yeah. gamma super soldier whatever that is you know and he becomes the hulk now is is the hulk sci-fi at that point like because that I would be so. very grounded well and you, you know? think i mean to take it even further um in the first thor movie the um uh, uh, you know Jane Foster and and her scientist crew when they meet up with Thor. I I mean I'm sure this is explicit because I, I have this memory of this, but I can't remember the quote where he he basically says something like, you know, you call it science and we call it magic and we're talking about the same thing. Oh um, sure, you yeah, know? yeah, yeah. So it's, oh, yeah, I mean, no, yes, because yeah, he's drawing it. He's like he's like your ancestors used to call it magic. It's like you you today call it science. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's um, it's you know I mean why not i mean because that's that is definitely how i perceive all superhero stories is i think of them as as a kind of science fiction mm -hmm. so that's mm -hmm. probably something that some somebody who's going to distinguish between science fiction and, and hard sci-fi is definitely going to give me shit about that but but there's there's such a especially on marvel side uh, but then i almost said but then especially on dc side but you know those marvel mm -hmm. characters like the mutants, for example, I think is are were such a 
a, uh, a, an effort at, at, at sort of sci-fi and, and going, mm -hmm. no, we're going to give, the, you know, in the wake of the atomic age, mutants start appearing on Earth. That is, I mean, there are mutants. You know, I mean, that is a thing that we know about are like mutations. You know, there are blue lobsters and, you know, things like that. Like there are, um, that's, a, that's a, a scientific fact. And so just extrapolating it a little bit and going, what if people, you know, mutated to have these powers is a really mm -hmm. cool science fiction question. And honestly, where I always um, have a conflict with Marvel Comics is when it goes beyond that and it's like, you know, there's gods and goddesses fighting with them or, you know, mm -hmm. something like Galactus or something that you can't, you know, is sort of like this force in the universe that, you know, what's a puny mutant going to <laughs> do to fight that off? Yeah, and, yeah. Um, when those stakes well, get so get, crazy, you know? When we get into things like the Infinity Gauntlet and the Infinity Gems and, you know, the godlike power to, you know, like that sort of, then it starts to strain. I think, I think that puts that firmly in the world of fantasy just because and just like dr who it's it's almost one thing too many where it's like well you've you are too many link you're too many links away from making this seem logical so now it's just fantasy and i think that's really where a lot of this comes down to where i think people will draw the line the ardent you know i know what sci-fi is people like those people will draw the line at if you can explain to me how this would reasonably work, even in the logic of the universe. Like, let's say they've discovered time travel, so that yields this, which yields this, which yields this, which yields this thing. Like, if that line can be drawn, great. But I think if you draw, if, if that becomes like, you know, instead of four or five you know, connection points, if it becomes, you know, 25 connection points. Right. Or, you know, so I think that's where it's like, nope, too many, too hard to explain. It's, it is purely fantasy now. And we will, and I think Doctor Who, that's where they have the problem with the current series and that there's a lot of things that just sort of happen on the show that if you really thought about it and diagrammed it, it's like, well, no, there is a good scientific basis for this. Um, even, you know, scientific in the show's, you know, reality. Uh, but I think, I think people just go, it's, it, if, if they can't, if it can't be assessed in the moment as being scientific, um, I think that's where it sort of gets just thrown in the realm of fantasy. And I don't, right. the reason, let me bring up another, the, the reason I sort of started asking this question was, again, you and I really don't care about genre, which is great. Um, I do think though, that when it comes to sci-fi and, and obviously we, there, I mentioned the fact that, you know, content creators have to still work within parameters and labels to, to some degree. Um, but I think there's this special place that sci-fi quote unquote has with, you know, you know, fans of the genre, it means something to them. It means something specific about it. There's a commentary about humanity you know, baked into it. There's well, a commentary about what we yeah. could or should be that's baked into it, you know? Um, yeah. And like I'm not my... saying sci-fi... Oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. <laughs> I was saying, not that sci science fantasy doesn't have that, but I feel like there's a more of a deliberate attempt. Like, Star Trek was a commentary on, like, you know, how we can as a people be better and you know how diversity can manifest itself and how we can strive for a higher ideal. Star Wars is, you know, more about good versus evil and these kind of like broader, right. broader stripes that I don't think people like to put in a, a sci-fi. Like, I think the, I think that sci-fi context does come down a lot to, you know, besides just the stylistic choices it comes down to a lot of what are we saying about ourselves and our environment with this story? Um, yeah. And that's one thing where Dune very much is sci-fi because it's there's a lot baked into that about conservation, about you know, the potential of humanity, about what what happens when you you know ba you know basically oppose a you know impose apartheid on a people like all of these things kind of come up and, and they're very deliberately baked. It's not like they're just incidental; they're baked into that story. So right. I think that's where a lot of people go, "Oh no, it is sci-fi because that does that." Well, that do you 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 brought up a a. a funny comment in my mind which is um like my mother would say i don't like sci-fi like so anything <laughs> that has space or robots it, it's just written off you know and and my dad would say i love sci-fi but if it but then if it happens on earth like if it's a dystopian sort of alternate present day he doesn't necessarily like it you know like i don't i don't mm -hmm. think he would like district nine mm -hmm. even though even though he would tell you like sci-fi like he loves Alien, so there's just this funny, like those genres do kind of matter. Like people literally rule out and or rule in, you know, entire 
genres that way. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, hopefully we're getting to some post genre, uh, you know, meta criticism of it where we can look at star Wars and go, you know, yeah, it's, you know, it's a space opera that's been influenced by samurai films and sci-fi or something like that, you know, and it's, we can sort of pick and choose with, you know, everything is a remix. We can kind of, we can just reverse engineer the, the shows and movies we like and figure out where they came from, but we're not really, you know, stuck on putting it in a, in a category. Yeah. I, you know, I don't know. And that's, I, that's my dream. <laughs> I actually, you know, and, and I, honestly, I don't think we can even, I, I think that's a, perfect a perfect pin to put in it right there um I'll tell you, <laughs> the reason that the thing that keeps flashing to my head is and i think i've said this on a podcast before so I, in college i worked at blockbuster video <laughs> mm -hmm. and i worked at several different stores and there were two there at the time there was this weird experiment that blockbuster did which was some of the stores they would give like they're generally like say five main categories there was like you know mm -hmm. drama comedy action adventure and maybe romance and kids or something, you know, something like that, big, broad stuff like that. So I, I don't even think sci-fi was a separate genre. It was like under action or something. Can you believe that, that there was a time where that was actually, like if Blockbuster still existed in its previous format today, there would be a comic books movie section. Probably. So I worked in this store for a while that was like a, a prototype store where they were trying out um, they were, you know, beta testing, if you will, even though they'd already released it into the wild, was super sub genres of stuff. So yeah. everything was like color coded, you know, like uh, uh, drama would be, you know, color coded blue. But then the aisle, when you're looking at it, there's like six different things there. Like we had a, there was an action spy movie 007, like taxonomy. <laughs> so. Wow. So it would drive people crazy because I would be like, okay, listen to me. You're going to have to go four rows back and one row over. And it's <laughs> like, you'll see at the very end, it just says yeah, 007. Yeah. All the James Bond movies are right there because they would, you know, of course they'd come up to the desk and be like, dude, I looked in action. I looked in spy movie. I looked at me. <laughs> yeah, we broke, we even broke James Bond out into like a sub sub genre. So, but I still think that after all that, they had sci-fi slash fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think it was still like a subgenre. You know, it was like, it just, I don't know. Well, that's what, as we're, we're talking about this, because I just remember, you know, back in the day going, God damn it, this is so frustrating. Just alphabetize the whole store. You know, you know what, though, that's like, maybe where a lot of the consternation comes from, from these hardcore sci fi fans, is that it has been lumped in with fantasy for so long. They feel the need to say, no, 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 no. This is sci fi. The rest yeah. is sci fi. You know, that's sci fi fantasy. I think that's probably because fantasy fans don't care. I don't. I haven't yet met a person who's like, oh, no, fantasy is pure, and it's this. I don't think they really care as much. Um, I, I think I there's sci-fi. There's this group of sci-fi fans who are like, no, no, pure sci-fi is what I'm into. I'm like, okay. A couple of years ago at um, San Diego Comic-Con, I saw George Martin do a panel, because, um, of course, I never got into the Game of Thrones panel, but he did this other smaller panel where because there was a publisher adapting his – early short stories into comic books and mm -hmm. someone asked him that very question like does this story come into you know fantasy or is it sci-fi or is it and he just was like i never even i didn't care about any of that <clears throat> i you know i didn't write like i don't write thinking of a genre so if it crosses over mm -hmm. from fantasy to sci-fi to you know horror that's fine but there mm -hmm. definitely is mm -hmm. some you know some swath of people that wants to categorize something, you know, <laughs> they want the blockbuster sub sub genres that they can put it in. Mm -hmm. Well, I think on that note, because we're <laughs> almost at an hour and I think you summed it up beautifully. Uh, <laughs> if you're listening to this and you have opinions on it, I, uh, let us hear from you. Like I want, I want to know what other people think and how they define this and just it, did, were we, did we miss the mark completely? Um, you know, is our assessment fairly in line with what you're thinking? Let us know. I would love to continue the conversation, you know, as time goes on. Yeah, you can find us at toddandtaylor.com. We have a website up. It's got links to our Twitter profiles and all of our past episodes. Go there. Go there. We also have toddandtaylorshow.com. goes to the same place. So in case you add a show or forget the show, it's all, <laughs> all, all works the same. Um, yeah, that's cool. Now we just have one place to plug. They can find our Twitter accounts. We don't have to spell things with the Mickey Mouse rhyme or anything like that. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs>
You'll see it all there. And, you know, enjoy our many fine podcasts. We have one on summer movie review, one on spy movies, one on Doctor Who, and, of course, our last one on our comic book roundup. So many fine episodes. You can you can all see. Those are all season one, too. Season zero episodes are a little bit less uh, organized. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I started adding names to the episodes to to, you know, categorize them beyond just episode one, two, three, and I got to season zero and went, I give up. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Season zero. The reason we did that is because basically all those episodes in totality constitute what's essentially just a pilot season. You know, it's like we had episode zero, which was us just kind of, you know, messing around trying to figure out if there's a show here. And then I feel like all of season zero, all of those, you know, first, you know, first five or six are kind of that as a whole, you know, like what works. Yeah. And there's good stuff there, but a lot of it was just our, us figuring it out. And truthfully, us figuring out the technology side of things. One of the big, you know, one of the big behind the scenes things about season one was we figured out how to record this very efficiently in, in, a, in a very leap, unstressful way, let's just say. Yeah. So, awesome. I love that. Another, yeah, another great show. Another great <laughs> show. Yeah. You can find you, uh, where, where can they find you out in the, out in the wild? I'm on Twitter at Hey Todd A. And my website is Hey com. And I am on Twitter at Taylor Trask, T A Y L O R L O R T R A S K. Yeah, that's right. T A Y L T R S K Daily Dress. Here I am. I, I don't know what else. I need to find. I need to go back and find the classic, like the new Mickey Mouse Club theme music, because they remember they added like a hip hop kind of groove to it. It's like M I C K E Y M O U S E. He's here. He's here. and they kind of just keep keep going. That was man. A, now I got to yeah. hear the hip hop theme. Yeah, just go Google. I'm sure YouTube has um, YouTube probably has every episode, but just go Google like. 90s Mickey Mouse Club, and you'll find, uh, I'm sure, a treasure trove of, of wonderful things. Sweet. All right. Well, until next week, uh, I've been Todd A, and you have been Taylor Trask. We'll see you guys later. Adios.